Welcome to the Psychedelic Diaries. I am your host, Ray Krishna. Mm. So we have a show for you today. Today we'll discuss psychedelic documentaries, novel ketamine delivery, and of course, experiences on high doses of magic mushrooms. Zappy Zappelin of Psychoceutical will be here momentarily for a deep dive and a soul search. But as usual, let's start things off with a nugget and a noodle. In today's news nugget, the DEA has thrown a wet blanket on legalization momentum by outlawing research on five additional psychedelic drugs. And the drugs are already illegal, and the move specifically just makes research more difficult. So not the best look from the DEA on this one. And as for the noodle, something I've been noodling on of late, how do we find the sweet spot for psychedelics? On one extreme, they're kind of becoming a little bit over-medicalized. On the other side, there's a little bit too much woo-woo. Where's the Goldilocks zone? A lot of people want to explore their consciousness and their relationship with reality without insurance companies or chakra crystals. Intentional psychedelic use can actually be very simple. Get a safe space, dial in set and setting, and establish a very clear intention. Then launch. So what is the honey hole for middle class psychedelics? Something to noodle on. Well, that's it for the nugget and the noodle. Our next guest is the chief visionary officer at Psychoceutical. He is the producer of the documentary, The Reality of Truth, Zappy Zappelin. Welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. <laughs> Honored. So many great guests. I'm, you know, just excited to be uh, part of the family. Oh, I appreciate having you here. So this is going to be a fun interview. Let's dive right in, Zappy. You were ahead of the curve on this one. And this psychedelic renaissance, obviously, it's in full swing. But you released your documentary, The Reality of Truth, in 2016. And I'm curious. How would you compare and contrast the psychedelic climate when you were filming back in 2014 and 15 versus now in 2022? Yeah, you know, um, at the time, everybody was telling me, and I really started to film it back in about 2012, and people were saying, Zappy, don't talk about this, you know, just kind of skate around the edges. It's just too controversial. And I said, well, no, this is something that's personal to me. You know, I was having a spiritual midlife crisis at that time where I'd done everything society told me to do, but I just, you know, wasn't totally fulfilled. And I thought back to when I had done psychedelics when I was younger and I had an incredible experiences. And I thought to myself, you know what, if I could use these plant medicines to go inside myself with the right intent, maybe I could get some of the answers that I'm looking for. And so for me, even though people were saying, don't do it, don't talk about it, don't film anything. I was just like, you know what, this is for me. And if I can share it through film, then it maybe can help a lot of other people. And I don't really care. You know, this 10 years ago, I was saying, uh, you know, these things I'm hearing about like ayahuasca and San Pedro, uh, I have to, you know, really explore this because the other things aren't working. I already made the money. I had the family. I did what society told me to do. And here I am, like I'm supposed to be fulfilled, but I'm not. I still have questions and I still need some healing. Well, it's funny because I, when I started talking about my own personal experiences, I went through a similar uh, vexing process of, oh my gosh, is this too much? Am I sharing too much? And I was like, no, I'm going to be bold. And I'm going to write down my experience. And then I look up and I'm like, this guy Zappy already did a documentary about it eight years ago, put his, his whole story out there. So Thank you for being one of those mavericks. And, you know, in this interconnected universe, we all kind of affect each other. And I think you've had a profound impact on this entire industry. So, again, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm curious, as you have now parlayed some of this psychedelic expertise into an actual company, Psychoceuticals, with this focus on drug delivery. And I think you're also talking about engineering out some of the hallucinogenic experiences, which I think is fascinating. Zappy, as you look back at the last 12 months for Psychoceutical or even Keta MD, your other brand, what is a hard-earned lesson that stands out and what's a current challenge? 
Um, you know, it's interesting because what's happening is the industry is moving so fast that by the week almost, where it used to be big changes happened every six months and then monthly and now weekly and now daily, you see some kind of science coming out or some type of legislative action taking place. So I think like a lot of the challenges that existed a year ago or even two months ago, they're shedding, you know, public perception is changing. Um, you know, my feeling is that we still need to do a lot of educating because the people who are going to make the decisions about legalization and, and commercialization of the medical establishment and the politicians, they really don't know about this. So it's not as though there is some conspiracy to keep psychedelics away from people. And a lot of times people theorize that, oh, they don't want people to wake up. So they're suppressing it. But in reality, yes. they just really don't know about it. And if you think about a doctor, you know, these guys don't even know about nutrition and that <laughs> can pretty much solve everything that they're trying to do. And they have like two weeks of nutrition or a week of nutrition in their whole medical training. So they don't know about psychedelics. It's up to the psychonauts like you and me and this community to educate them, to normalize it. You know, what's exciting is that, you know, I used to have to start at the beginning and start to talk about, well, here's what psychedelics are. Here's what the opportunity is. Here's what happened to me. Now it's like I can start on you know, third base. And I can be like, okay, well, you know, we got a mental health crisis and you know that these psychedelics are showing promise. Well, here's what we need to do. Let me tell you about this. So for me, you know, a lot of the impediments like you were referencing that existed a year ago, six months ago, a month ago, a week ago, they're coming off because people would say something like, oh, well, yeah, but you know, that hasn't been proven and now there's evidence. And then they go, well, yeah, but it's not long term. And then they go, oh, shoot, there is. And, you know, so it's just all the barriers have been falling in. And for me, I kind of stepped back recently and I said to myself, the one thing that's going to help this industry more than anything else is going to be legalization. Yes. That catalyst is going to be huge. Rescheduling from schedule one to schedule two or three is going to have a huge effect. And then ultimately legalization is going to be the thing that, you know, really changes society. But I started a nonprofit called the Mind Army because once you realize that, you know, legalization is the most important thing for industry and for society, for mental health, all of a sudden you realize, wow, we have to push this initiative. And the Mind Army's uh, slogan is fighting for the right to pursue happiness. Mm. And that is like at the beginning of the constitution, we're guaranteed that. And so if we are in a society where, you know, we're not having that, we, uh, we should be allowed to go inside of ourselves to find that happiness. And the way that I've seen people get instantly more empathy, more happiness, 180 degree change in their perspective is either they have a near death experience, which doesn't happen to most people, or they have some kind of breakthrough with psychedelics. And so I believe that the Mind Army, uh, and I'd love anybody listening to join the Mind Army, but we are demanding the right to go inside our minds right now. We are acting as though it's totally legal right now because we can't sit here in 2022 and have people tell us that alcohol is good, tobacco is good, but psilocybin is bad. And even if your family member is, you know, facing a life or death situation, sorry, it's off the table because 55 years ago, we decided we needed to study it for safety and then nothing happened. So sorry, you can't use it. And I'm just like, no, we're in a mental health crisis. We don't accept this. And if that means that the Mind Army has to be the most radical movement in the country to get this done, we don't care. We're doing it. And for me, this is going to what's going to raise all boats, all ships rise with this tide from publicly traded companies to research. We have to get this legal. And as I said, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's a complete lack of information. And we just have to continue to pile that information on. And so... What we're doing, Ray, is we're uh, going 
in a similar fashion to what other large industries do where they lobby the government, they put up money to get campaigns going. We're going to bring celebrity. We're going to bring uh, lobbying directly to the politicians and the medical establishment. But we're basically demanding that the president write an executive order to the DEA asking them to immediately review the rescheduling uh, situation and look at the science because it has not been looked at in 55 years. And as you alluded to at the top of the show, they're actually putting, you know, more compounds onto that list, not realizing that those compounds themselves could be the key that unlocks human capital and brings this society back. Ah, that's wonderful. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It kind of reminds me of that idea of if you want to know where the line is, sometimes you got to cross it. Sometimes you got to get on that line and dance on it. And this like rhetoric of, well, more research is needed. Well, more research is needed. I'm like, there's been a lot of research. We've already seen a couple smoking guns, like with nicotine cessation with psilocybin. It was 80% success. We've had nothing that close with some of the end of life treatment and anxiety reduction with some of the depression. There's, we've already seen enough. Yeah. And then you go back to the 55 years ago, we had a lot of smart people working on those trials then. So it's like, yes, it's time to stop dragging the feet, stop with the five, 10 year reschedule process. Do it now. Thank you for doing what you're doing, Zappy. I love this direct approach. And it's kind of like a single issue politics. Just go right to the source and change it. Uh, so speaking of that, actually, my discovery of, of what Magic Mushrooms did after essentially five years of high dose sessions once a month, uh, changed my life because I saw what it did to my cognition, my creativity, and my purpose. And it was illegal. I was doing it. It was illegal. And, and yep. yet I did it because it, I knew it felt right. And for you, I'm curious, for those that haven't seen the documentary, um, I'm curious what your journey with psychedelics has been like. And, and specifically, Zappy, you talked about this really interesting concept of you made the money, you got the family, you got the stuff, checked all the boxes, and yet you felt the sense of dissatisfaction. And I'm curious, what changed? Yeah, you know, um, I, I was really lucky because if I had found myself in that situation without any tools, I don't know, I might have just been like, screw it, this isn't worth it. You know, I, I followed a false promise. And, but, I remembered back in that time to an experience I had as a teen where I took a large dose of mushrooms and I had an experience where that changed my life, where I, all of a sudden I was sitting there and I looked at my hand and I could see that it was like billions of atoms, trillions of atoms, and they were vibrating at a certain frequency. Hmm. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is frequency. That's my frequency. And then I looked over at my friend and I could see that he was the exact same atoms, but they were just vibrating at a slightly different frequency than mine. Mm. And I looked at the table, same atoms, different frequency. I was like, oh, wow, this is how it really works, you know? So when I came out of that experience, I couldn't unsee that. You know, I can still close my eyes right now and see everything, you know, in that in the context of frequency. And so when I later was in this spiritual midlife crisis, I thought back and I was like, you know, that was such a, you know, out of the box solution or a moment for me. I'm hearing about ayahuasca and sitting with shaman. I'm like, what if that's the same kind of experience? Maybe I could use this to get some more insight into myself and, and how the universe works. And that was my impetus to, to do that. And so it's it, that's exciting. I want to tell you though why I'm pounding the table. Like I could probably like a lot of people just rest on my laurels and kick back on my hammock and just you know chill and be like, oh, I'll check it out. I'll come back in five years and everybody will be using mushroom microdosing instead of antidepressants, and I'll just leave it at that. But the reason I can't stop and I'm going every day and I'm honored to be on a show like this is that we've got a crisis moment coming. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, who's become, you know, the chief science officer at Google, and he's a great futurist. He says that in 2045, which is not long from now, we are going to reach singularity. 
And that means that we will have a, our brains will be directly connected to the cloud, to the, to the cloud internet, and we will have AI running calculations for us at that point. And he said that in 2045, the average person who has this technology embedded is going to be 1 billion times more intelligent than we are today. A billion times, okay? <laughs> and with that kind of power comes a lot of responsibility because at a billion times more intelligent, if I want to blow up Miami or, you know, destroy something, I could do it in that moment. And I think, you know, you think about, wow, well, if some high school kid breaks up with his girlfriend or boyfriend and then gets pissed off and decides they want to destroy New York City, they can do it in an instant. And so before that power happens in 2045, we have to raise the collective consciousness of society to be able to handle that. And the only way you raise consciousness quickly, raise empathy, is through these incredible tools that we have that allow you to you know, elevate your consciousness. So I'm pounding the table and saying, we can't wait. We can't wait till 2044 and go, oh, you know what? How, how are we going to raise consciousness? Because we have a lot of power. We have to do it today. We've got to get a critical mass. That's what the Mind Army's mission is. It's like, let's get this critical mass now so we can handle this situation coming up with this technology. Oh, that's fantastic. It kind of reminds me of that the whole double slit experiment observation changes the outcome. It's like the more we take our focus and our consciousness on this problem, the more we are actually collapsing the Tesseract into a new reality that has this yes. more connected, more uh, interactive and kinder and healthier universe in a way. So it's almost like if there is a multiverse, we can kind of shift over to one of the healthier realities out there. And it sounds like when you talk about this stuff, I think you and I probably are kind of prone to it. It's easy to get hyperbolic and yet it feels warranted. The stakes are yeah. so high with this. So I appreciate what you're doing. And um, Zappi, you did such a brilliant job of describing that vibrational uh, frequency on your hand and you saw your friend doing it. And I'm curious, uh, it, actually one little aside, I've, I've thought in deep trips that the, that fifth dimension, if you will, so there's three dimension of space and then time, and then that fifth dimension um, may actually be attraction or some sort of vibration, attraction, frequency or ratio. And that's the dimension. And I'm curious mm. for you, one powerful mystical experience. So you said that reminded you. So you went back and did uh, ayahuasca. I'll share one quick one I had. Yeah. And then I'll kick it yeah. to you. Zavi, I had one where it felt as if I was an alien consciousness that was zapped into this human avatar. All mental and physical memories were gone. And it was like the universe said, okay, go. What can you do with this? And it kind wow. of changed my whole perspective on life. And I'm curious for you in your later years, Zappy, what is one profound mystical experience that still resonates with you? Um, well, one of the, the most powerful one for me, uh, I didn't describe it in the reality of truth film, uh, but I did describe part of the moment. But what happened to me was that this changed my life was that I was deep in this ayahuasca experience. I was hours in, I got to this place where I knew I could ask any question. And I, I asked the question that I describe in the reality of truth, like, why do bad things happen? And I was like pulled out to the edge of the universe. And I was looking at like everything <laughs> contained in the universe, like maybe God would be looking at it. And I saw it and, and the spirit said to me, do you see that? It's perfectly balanced. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, you know what? Like, wow, it is. Like if something happens over here, it gets made up. And I had that, I described that in the reality of truth. But what I didn't say is I was hearing this voice for the first time, God conscious voice said to me, and it said to me, do you know how you're breathing right now? And I like thought about it. I was like, no, I, I don't know how I'm breathing. And it said, do you know how you're growing your hair? You're doing it, but do you know how? And I, I was like, no, I don't know how. And it said, then what makes you think I need your help? And I was <laughs> like, wow, that's it. I was like, I'm free. I go, if I don't even know how I'm breathing, what am I going to get all upset? Because these people aren't listening or they're fighting. It's like, I, if I don't breathe for two minutes, I die and I don't even know how I'm doing it. I surrender. I'm not going to worry about anything else ever again. 
oh, that was my moment, you know, of freedom and surrender. That is beautiful. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Why do you think I need your help? Oh, that's good. Um, so Zappy, switching gears a little bit, uh, looking at the big picture. So some of the stuff you're doing and uh, some of the movements you're inciting, the psychedelic renaissance, let's just wave a magic wand and say it works. And we get full scale commercial legalization and access to all. And then fast forward a couple of years and we've got widespread intentional use. What does that world look like? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's going to be beautiful, but I think we have to help to usher that in as quickly as possible. And that's why I'm involved with this company called Psychosuitable, because my feeling is if we want to have adoption beyond just, OK, they're legal now, what do you want to do? I think for the medical establishment to feel really good, these things are going to have to look like a pharmaceutical to them. So my company, Psychoceutical, is kind of the best of psychedelics meets the best of pharmaceuticals. And the idea there is that, you know, a doctor's not going to feel comfortable to say, hey, psilocybin mushrooms have been proven to be incredible. Why don't you go home and take, you know, one cap and one stem and let me know how it goes. That's not happening. What they need is a format that resembles a psych uh, pharmaceutical product. So what Psychoceutical did was we licensed two patents from the pharmaceutical industry and we brought them over and licensed them for the psychedelic industry. And the two patents are really incredible because uh, the effect that they're going to have and the ability to resemble pharmaceuticals is the promise. So we've got one patent that is where you deliver a psychedelic compound, a neuroactive compound, it's called NeuroDirect. You deliver it at the back of the neck, at the base of the hairline. And what it, what it turns out is unlike any other place on the body, when you deliver it right here, it goes into the free nerve endings underneath the skin directly to the brain. So you're bypassing the whole systemic system, which is where all of the side effects take place. The psychedelic experience, nausea, dizziness, lethargy. All that is because it's working its way through the systemic system. So if we, instead of taking uh, some mushrooms and it converts into psilocin and you get that reaction at some point and you have this experience by delivering psilocin at the back of the neck, neuro direct, you get this, you get the experience right away. It's not a psychedelic experience, but you get the effect of the medicine. You get the neurogenesis and you don't have that psychedelic experience. So this opens it up to children, to the elderly, to people who are afraid. They know that this is going to be monumental, but they're afraid. So they can use the psychoceutical. It takes effect immediately and they're able to get the benefits of the compound. The second uh, patent is really breakthrough. It's uh, University of Michigan developed. Uh, it's called Janus Particles. And what it means is we've got these layered nanoparticles where we can put together any compounds. We could put together multiple psychedelics together. We could put an oil-based one with a water-based one. We put them together in these layered nanoparticles. And, and whatever we develop, whether it's every hour or two hours, a, a layer comes off and you get more of the medicine. Hmm. So this means that we could basically do uh, microdosing, which is very hard because usually if you want to microdose something like ketamine, you got to take it every hour or two. You forget if you took it. Here you take some tincture, some topical, a nasal. It's in your system, nanoparticles. And every you know hour or two hours that we set, you're going to get more of the medicine. But what's really exciting is in the Janus particles, you can make these molecules any size and any shape. And they found out that Triangular shapes, because this was developed for cancer drugs, oncology, uh, triangular shape molecules uptake exponentially better than other shapes. So we're going to be able to take these, uh, these psychedelics, target them. So you take as little as possible, you get maximum bioavailability, and we're able to combine them with other complementary compounds. Zabby, congratulations. This, the base of the spine delivery, this Janus particle stuff. 
this is really cool and i'm with you we kind of we do have it's a team effort we have to win the hearts and minds of the medical community as well so i appreciate this multifaceted approach you are taking this has been a phenomenal deep dive we got to transition to the soul search speed round zappy question number one what is one famous person dead or alive that you'd like to trip with I would have to say Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, because I just love his spirit of sharing. You know, he invented give the music away and don't care about it. And I just think he has that attitude of don't take anything too seriously. Good call out. Yeah, he's kind of one of the godfathers. Okay, question number two. Zappy, you are on a desert island and you only get to bring one mind altering substance with you for 10 years. Who you got? I'm going to bring ketamine with me because I think ketamine saves Western society. With ketamine, it's like this micro crystal. It always goes well. And as you go up in the dose, it's like a different experience every single time. So you would never get sick of it. You would never stop unpeeling the layers. So <laughs> ketamine for me, no doubt, that's the one. Okay, respect. Question number three. Zappy, you have to go relive one full year of your life, which year would you choose? I think the last year of this pandemic is the one that I would live because uh, as other people were kind of hiding out, I ran around. Uh, when I have a new documentary that's going to be out soon. It's called Frequency, the Future of Everything. And it's about how frequency medicine is coming, frequency agriculture, frequency energy, and psychedelics of the future, these frequencies, instead of taking uh, the medicine, you're going to put on some headphones, you're going to receive the frequency of psilocin or ketamine or whatever it is, it's going to cause an electrical reaction in your brain, physical reaction. And so I was able to go out and run around the country and, you know, um, enjoy uh, that experience. So I think I would have to say this last year has been the best for psychedelics and for um, you know, what I do in the documentary world. It's been fantastic. I appreciate that. Zappy is still peaking. 2021 was his year. Okay. The last question is kind of relevant. Zappy, who is one person that has had a dramatic impact on your career? Um, my first boss who hired me on Wall Street, uh, Mike Milken, the famous uh, Wall Streeter, philanthropist, had an incredible uh, effect on my life, still does. I'm still friends with him. I go to his Milking Global Conference every year and sit on panels and moderate. You know, he's, he really changed my life by giving me a, a job back in 1988. 1988. And that's cool. That would probably warm his heart to hear that. Okay, Zappy, that was a fun soul search. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you for joining the show. Really quick before we jump, what is your ask of the users? I know you have a cool newsletter, investment newsletter. What would be an action item for the, the listeners and, and viewers? Um, I'd love you to join the Mind Army and see what we're doing. Stay tuned, you know, zappyzappelin.com. You can go to zappyzappelin.com or find me on social media. But we've got KetaMD, which is an at-home ketamine treatment that's going to launch soon. And I think that's going to be incredible for people to be able to access ketamine in a cost-effective way in their own home. And I have a newsletter called Palm Beach Special Ops. Uh, my partner, Tika Tawari, who's a famous uh, Wall Streeter, him and I are doing a newsletter about psychedelics and alternative technology. And so check out Palm Beach Special Ops. I think my idea is that you, me, the rest of the psychonauts were so early that we deserve to be the people who make a lot of money from this trend. And I'm telling people, if you buy good companies right, th right now and you just sit there and wait for rescheduling to happen or legalization when that happens, these are catalysts that are going to bump these stocks. And we, we're saying that you could, this is like owning the pharma companies in the 1920s or the biotech companies in the 1990s, you could make a hundred years of stock market returns in the next 18 months. So I encourage anybody, it's as simple as owning, like there are now these exchange traded funds, these ETFs. You can just buy one of those. It's a basket of all the top psychedelic stocks. Buy some of that, put it away, don't look at it and come back to it in the next year or two. And you're probably going to see that you you know, you might've made 10 or 20 or 50 or hundred X on your investment. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. Go check that out. We'll get those links in the description. Zappy, this has been a fantastic time. Thank you for joining the show. Thank you. Appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for watching this episode of the Psychedelic Diaries. I am Ray Christian. We'll see you next time. Thank you.